All right, welcome back. Episode two of Parkour History with Max Henry. And this is part two of Georges Bear. So in the previous episode, we sort of covered the prehistory. It's almost the everything you need to know up until the point. And this is the point where it really starts to synthesize. And we start to see a more clear representation of what parkour is now reflected in the historical story that we are telling you guys. So very exciting. And I'll let Max take it away from here. Thank you. It is. It does feel cool, by the way, to say parkour history with Max Henry. Yeah, this is, he's the Dan Carlin of, <laughs> part, and, and he can do the voice if he has to. But. Oh, I don't know if we'll, <laughs> I think we will get sued if we do that, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Probably. In 1875, <laughs> George Hubert. Uh, we actually are starting in 1875, though. And we'll start with the birth of Hubert. His early life wasn't super eventful. Uh, as we talked about, his influences were long, but the way that he kind of came into those influences was uh, he was born in Paris, 1875. He was born to a relatively well-off family, and so he would go to museums and see artwork, see um, paintings and sculptures of either mythological or pseudo-historical Greco-Roman figures, and his reaction to them, ironically, is one that I also had at that same age going to the Met in New York, which was basically, wow, those people are jacked. How do I get like that? <laughs> <laughs> and for Georges Hubert, the realization that they were jacked went a very long way and <laughs> changed his life pretty dramatically. So in 1893, uh, at the age of 18, Hubert went to the Ecole Navale as the Navy school. And he entered into training to become essentially a naval officer in the French military. And his training went well. He was well-educated. He had, you know, no major issues getting into the officership. And what must have been exciting for a bear is that once he was in the Navy, he'd graduated. He was able to travel the world a little bit. One of my biggest pet peeves that I have in the recounting of this particular story amongst the parkour circle is often at this point people say, and then a bear went to Africa. A bear did not go to Africa at any <laughs> any point to my knowledge. A bear's ship, the Suchet, uh, was sent to the Caribbean and South America. So a bear was stationed in several places, um, Uruguay, Colombia, uh, Martinique, which will play a big impact in a little bit, and uh, Venezuela. And he kind of saw different things at all of those places, but... In each of them, he kept his eyes open, kind of Darwin-esque, on how movement impacted those cultures. The first stop for Hebert actually was in New York, and this was in 1898. Uh, when he went to New York and then Philadelphia, he stopped at a couple different places. He stopped at the University of Philadelphia, and he stopped at Attila's Athletic Studio and School of Physical Culture. Mm. And Attila's school is kind of like the birthplace of bodybuilding, and a bear coming from France knew that sports science and bodybuilding and physical conditioning were being developed in the Northeast in the United States in a very different way than they were in Europe. Europe was still latched on to this kind of artistic gymnastics inspired approach and weights and weight training and taking a little bit more of a quantitative approach to sports science was becoming very, very popular in the U.S., so when a bear had the chance to stop in those two places, he made a point of a point of going there and saw that these people had physiques like those Greek gods and goddesses mm -hmm. that he had looked at. So there was a fascination there that he started to develop with physique, with the aesthetic of the human body. And that kind of was fed by this uh, growing bodybuilding and strength scene that, that he discovered in New York and Philadelphia. But he didn't stay there for long. And once he left, he went down to uh, the Caribbean. He went to Haiti. He went to uh, Uruguay, Colombia, and Venezuela. And here he got to see the human body in action, not just kind of as a show horse, but as a workhorse. Mm. And the way that he synthesized, like you said earlier, the way that he synthesized the realities of how a human interacts with their environment and how they look that was really, really transformative for him. So 
we'll start with the uh, Martinique. The coal women of Martinique were one of the groups that he wrote about explicitly several times in his work. And these women were hauling uh, heavy loads of coal, generally stacked on their heads, sometimes carrying them with their hands uh, over rugged terrain for one or two or three miles. A lot of times these loads were like between 60 and 80 kilo, or sorry, 60 and 80 pounds. Hmm. So they were not light and a bear was impressed, obviously. (laughs) And I think that for him, this was a wake up call because he was used to women in middle to upper class French society. There was a certain standard for beauty at the time that didn't necessarily value uh, strength in the way that Hebert saw portrayed in these women in Martinique. And something clicked for him. He's like, oh, wow, these women look like the statues that I was seeing in the museum. And that was one of the first things that he started to kind of internalize. And then he went down into Colombia and to Uruguay, and he was interacting with these um, rebel fighters who were in the midst of a civil war. They were sleeping in the jungle. They were fighting and moving through terrain in all conditions. He was sometimes providing supplies, sometimes helping them uh, move you know, over water. But in all of those situations, he was just amazed at the resilience that they had, the endurance, and the different capacity for work they had compared to maybe the explosive strength of the bodybuilders that he'd seen in Attila's. But, you know, those guys in Attila's, you throw them in the rain and ask them to move a boulder with no purchase. Hmm. These guys had a type of innate physical knowledge that he hadn't seen before in sort of the North American and Western European uh, movement perspective. So they were developing this really intimate knowledge of their body. And a bear saw that he saw this cleverness that they had with how they used their body and how they used it in nature in particular, not just in these artificial halls for becoming stronger. So all of these experiences in Uruguay and Colombia, Venezuela, Martinique, these happened between 1898 and 1902 while a bear was traveling around on the Suchet. And the spring of 1902 ends up being a really critical time for a bear in a really distressing way. So Mount Pele, which is a volcano outside the city of Saint-Pierre in Martinique, had been active for a month or two. It had spewed some gas. Um, There had been a minor eruption. About 150 people had died uh, a week before the 8th. But citizens didn't really take action. They'd seen it happen before. And on the morning of May 8th, Mount Pele erupted explosively it was one of the worst natural disasters that the world had seen in recent history in terms of human casualty almost to a man the city of saint pierre is wiped off the map you have twenty-eight thousand people dead in instance and in the city there are two recorded survivors tens of people on the outskirts of the city managed to survive they're all badly burned Uh, Many of them die weeks or months later from their injuries. And into all of this, a bear who is, you know, 20 something years old, young man, is sent to lead a rescue mission. A bear manages to collect about... If I'm not mistaken, Mm -hmm. the Suchet, his ship, was the first to respond. Yes. So the legend goes, I don't know how factually pinpoint we can be or how precise that fact is is yeah i mean there may have been like fishing boats Mm. things like that but um as far as like a a a major ship goes Mm. the only recorded one that i could find record of was the Suchet, and there is record um there are newspaper articles about it there's uh some first-hand accounts from folks that a bear helped escape the island um approximately 700 people ended up being rescued over several days by a bear and his crew and uh, I sh- it should be mentioned, a bear is an ensign, so he's not the captain of the Suchet. Yeah. Uh, he was just the one that was in charge of the extricating these folks. And something that really sticks with a bear from this experience, I mean, I'd never read a firsthand account of this, and I did manage to find a couple interviews. It, I can't even begin to imagine how horrifying it must have been for people who were... <laughs> 
close enough to the city to see some of the damage because what kinds of things were they seeing that you I, remember from I the mean account? it was just you're talking like severe burns people being buried in ash people being trampled to death it was chaos and a bear was the one that was in charge of getting these people out safely and the ones who did survive many of them were injured uh, many of them you know some were suffocating dying from suffocation ash is clouding everything this is a major volcanic eruption and a bear i think was really transformed by this experience and realized that for his fascination with human movement to mean anything it needed to be grounded in something more than just developing movement as its own end and this ties back into what we talked about in the previous episode. He was an explorer. He was mm-hmm. following the other explorers at, you know, the bodybuilders. And by 1902, he'd started to wrap his brain around developing a systematic training approach for sailors. So his goal was prior to the eruption of Mount Pele, his goal was to create a way to train sailors on ships with minimal space and do it in a way that allowed them to use their whole body not use a lot of equipment. He'd also been majorly inspired by the movements of the top men in the Navy who were the folks responsible for handling all the rigging, the sails, and he'd see them clambering about barefoot in all types of weather. They had phenomenal balance. They were incredibly strong. Um, Their grip strength in particular was uh, of note to bear. But he realized that there was going to be something missing from his methodology that was fundamental if it ended at let's get sailors some exercise Mm. and Pele for sure was the the turning point for this. And a bear post Pele goes into writing what would kind of become the Bible of uh, his physical education career. And that was his um, book about method natural where he starts to outline his natural method and the ethos behind it. And that is the first time that you hear a phrase that we still say in parkour, which is être fort, pas être utile, and that is to be strong, to be useful. And that was Hebert's personal motto that he developed kind of in the wreckage of Pele was, you know, it's great to be strong, but it doesn't mean a whole lot if that strength if is you're not helpful. suffocating and you don't know how to get over a small, you know, structure to get out and away from the molten lava creeping yeah. towards you yeah. or the... <laughs> you know, people clamoring and panicking because they have no awareness or no ability to confront and deal with a situation so traumatic and and so intense as in a volcanic eruption. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the coolest, obviously one of the most tragic, but one of the coolest parts of the story of parkour is that a natural disaster actually was it played a critical role. This mother nature hit the force of earth herself, you know, getting involved in inspiring a bear, George, a bear to, to look differently at what is this all pointing to? What is this all for? Absolutely. Uh, I will bring up another one of my pet, pet peeves that I've been guilty of in the past. Mm. Something that is, I'd often heard about the story of Mount Pele is that a bear had watched the difference between how the, um, French immigrants to Martinique, you know, the, the socialites that were living it up because oh, this yeah. city, again, it was called the Paris of the West. It was, it was a sparkling city. It wasn't a slum. Uh, and a lot of wealthy French citizens lived there or went there to visit and vacation. And I'd often heard all over the place that a had been inspired by watching their incapacity versus the natural movement abilities of the locals and as I dug deeper and looked for that in any of his text, I couldn't find it. Mm. I, I, it might be somewhere if it is. And if, by the way, to anyone who is listening to this, if you are a fellow nerd <laughs> about parkour historical events um, and you have any corrections, by all means, send them in because I would love to do any corrections at the beginning of the next episode relating to the previous episode. Yeah, I'm not claiming that all of this is 100% perfect. Um, we've obviously done our best researching, but... <laughs> 
things can slip through the cracks. So if you catch one of those, let's make it 100% perfect by editing it uh, in our little editorial intro on the next episode. Or even like I can go back in, edit it, re-upload however it needs to be done. Yeah. You know, we, we'll, we'll make sure yeah, it's right. That's it's accurate. That is interesting. Yeah. Because obviously the juxtaposition is there in his mind or maybe yes. we, we can assume that it's there in his mind because and he, the Cole women in Martinique yeah. were, that's the same Island, right? Yeah. So he was very aware of the difference in physical mm-hmm. capacity between, for instance, in particular, the women that mm-hmm. were working these very, very physically intense jobs in Martinique and the women in high French society. Yeah. I think that is a, a, an obvious dichotomy that he was aware of. Yeah, but. it might not be that it was so explicit that he was like, oh, I'm watching one woman drown or whatever yeah. and the other one not. But she it's speed like vaulted over the, that wall. <laughs> she, <laughs> she did a sick double conk <laughs> over her own house. Uh, it's just, but it's clear. It, I mean, it it, it 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 seems reasonable to assume that just the very impact of the eruption itself can make it very clear and obvious what kinds of... Uh, you know, just how far off the beaten path we can get as a whole culture in terms of preparing ourselves. And, you know, obviously with even the pre-eruption where Mm -hmm. hundreds of people were died and yet we ignored it or they ignored it on the islands. And, um, I know, I think that's very fair that it was more of a, um, I think that it's a hundred percent accurate that it was a cultural thing that he had noticed and Mm -hmm. his move back toward utility as an emphasis Mm -hmm. for movement was in response to, a culture that was becoming less and less engaged with nature and with reality Mm -hmm. post industrial revolution. We were creating gardens and Mm -hmm. these beautiful places that were detached from the harsh realities of nature. And this was a huge wake up call for him. And I think this was a a moment where he stood up and said, wow, we need to re-engage with nature on a physical level because we're clearly doing something wrong. And I think that you're, you're spot on. Uh, it might not have been a direct comparison in that yeah. moment, but all those factors were there. That was certainly a, a conclusion that he drew from those circumstances. And so he dives in. He makes the the method natural at, in the wake of this eruption. Yes. He and starts writing down his principles. Absolutely. And this is a, it's important also that this wasn't like he, you know, yeah. came back down. He came down from <laughs> On the, the way home mountain like. <laughs> and <laughs> wrote this book. This is a process that his, his uh, most popular book, Physical Education or Complete Training Using the Natural Method, is finally published in 1912. And it was the culmination of kind of the next 10 years of work. So he gets back to France. He's got these ideas for how to change the way that soldiers are being trained. And he wants to also incorporate it into the civilian population. In 1904, he is given the chance to work at Lorient's Naval School. So this is a school with um, about a thousand students and you know the the french military i th- i have a feeling it was one of those situations where he came back very excited <laughs> they said we can give you a thousand people but we're not going to give you more than that we'll see how you do and he had a couple of years to train them and this was 1904 by 1906 they're doing well enough that he is put uh, in charge as head officer for the development of gymnastics education at Lorient. And he completely scraps all of the things that they were doing previously, which were these Prussian drill based regimented routines. And he introduces a new athletic test that measures athletes performance of skills. uh, And it uses that kind of Northeast quantitative approach that he'd, seen a little bit of at University of Philadelphia and Attila School, and it was also heavily influenced by uh, another contemporary of his in France named Georges Demeny, who was a cinematographer, pioneer in cinematography, but also fascinated with the human body, and he was one of the first to do uh, like frame-by-frame recordings of human movements mm-hmm. and look at how the body moved in action and be able to stop at certain points. So he was also starting to kind of quantify variables that went into human movement and a bear absorbed this and was just like let's go we're going all in this is 1906 <clears throat> and he tested 12 skills these skills were 100 500 and 1500 meter run long and high jump uh from standing and from running he did rope climbs he did stone tosses for distance weightlifting 100 meter swim and an underwater dive which 
covers almost all of the bases that Rabelais had outlined and then Amaro and then Hebert himself outlines later on in his, his book, The Natural Method. There wasn't any combat self-defense training not in, in these courses list. but they were it was a military school mm. and so i'm not sure that they were working direct self-defense in in a separate place mm. but um, his main concern with this new drill was prior to a bear from what i could gather <laughs> and it sounds so ridiculous that i i hesitate to say this is 100 percent true but from the resources that i read that were contemporary it it seems as if the way they measured progress of their students was like, how jacked did they look after the workout? <laughs> <laughs> so it was almost entirely based on uh, body composition and kind of a feel for how athletic mm. participants were. And a bear realized that that was very, very open-ended and flawed. And so mm. he said, well, let's, let's get some numbers in here. And that I think it might've been a reason why he didn't immediately incorporate self-defense here. Mm. Um, it's a little bit harder to quantify person to person, the development. So he stuck with things that were really easy to measure growth. And that was 1906. Mm -hmm. um, in 1912, after six years of this quantified measured approach, he feels confident enough to release his first book, Again, that's the physical education or complete training using the natural method. And here he outlines those 10 movement categories. He outlines how to quantify them and how to train them. He also outlines his ethos, his être faux être utile, and encourages athletes to participate with their physical training outdoors as much in nature as possible. He was also influenced by this uh, movement in France at the time called the Naturist Movement, um, a man named Paul Carton. And their whole idea of health was that you had to engage as much with nature as possible. So it was, you know, train in as few clothes as you can get away with socially. Mm -hmm. So take your shirt off, you know, go in your boxers, go barefoot, engage with the natural world to the fullest extent that you can. Mm -hmm. And all of this is outlined in his book in 1912. And in 1913, a is given the opportunity to perform in a showcase for the International Congress of Physical Education in Paris. So this is, you know, nine years after he was given his initial start at Lorient to work with these folks. Some of them he's been working with the entire time. Hmm. They were all ages. Uh, initially, it was just the students, but he ended up working with boys from 8 to 20. He also worked with uh, women and young girls, and he worked with some older men as well by the end of this program. And the French government doesn't seem to expect much from this showcase from a bear's perspective. And <laughs> I, I love this because it kind of reflects something that happens later on in parkour history. Really the first time people get to see parkour mm. in yeah, action. It's like the curtain finally comes up in, in France. Exactly. He's been in the lab for nine years. Yeah. And if you weren't at Lorient, you didn't really know what he was, what he was doing over there. Yeah. Especially back then. It's not like, yeah. And everybody no else comes out and you've got all of these countries represented, um, you know, all over the world, they're sending people and they're all going out and they're doing their Prussian drill and they're turning around and they're incredibly well coordinated. And some <laughs> of them are very jacked. So they must've trained really hard because those two things are the measures of progress. And the kind of curtain comes up on a bears athletes mm. And they just come running out and they're, I actually, I, I believe I've seen a video. I don't know if this was 1913 or if it was a later demonstration. The video that I saw, the men that participated in the boys were in essentially short shorts, barefoot, no shirts. So you can mm. imagine everybody else in stuffy drill. This may not have been the first one, um, but I think it's good as a visual. They run out as a group of, you know, 30 to to 50 participants they're all of a sudden scantily clad by the times <laughs> and they're jumping over each other they're throwing things they're climbing like monkeys they're just moving incredibly different mm -hmm. and it's almost like it's so different it's primal in comparison it is com it is so primal that's the <laughs> perfect word and people don't know how to react mm. they see it and like what what is this? <laughs> this is surely not what he's been doing in Lorient for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> Where are these savages come from? But when compared to the movement 
quality mm. of everybody else. It's so clear the athleticism of the people that have trained in a bear's method and even by their own standards of body composition and aesthetics. These young men are really strong. They're really fit. They have endurance. They have the explosive capabilities and what they're doing is visually so out there and impressive. It just captures everyone's imagination. Mm. And almost overnight, a bear goes from <laughs> this guy who's barely given permission to work with a thousand people to director of the College of Athletes in Rennes. And so f the French government sees that and, and they're like, all right, you are now the director of this brand new facility that we built to train all of our Olympians and all of our soldiers who want to become Olympians wow. and any would-be athlete <laughs> in France. And this is, <laughs> this is in 1913, almost literally af overnight after the demonstration. Incredible. And what, how many, what's the, the jump in terms of like the volume of students that he's supervising now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know in terms of volume if it's mm. more significant, what but we do know the is the quality is like absolute exactly so uh, rem is where the spear at that point now that yes he's been in it's like going from of. it's like going from i don't know um <laughs> you know it's like going from a military school in indiana to west point yeah you know <laughs> it's like you can't get more prestigious than this posting if you mm. want to be a phys physical educator in france at the time mm. uh, additionally a lot of the other countries that were there immediately go up to George Hebert, they get his book and they start to adopt his method. So mm. Argentina, Belgium, um, places that would eventually have a big Méthode Naturelle community in, in several decades. And they all start in 1913 at this demonstration. So sadly for Hebert, it's 1913. He starts to work with uh, the athletes at Rheim. He doesn't even get a year before World War One breaks out. And... This brand new facility, the entire city, many of his students are consumed by the war. Mm. Um, the city is bombed, um, not not to the ground, but it is it's rubble in in many cases. A lot of his students end up on the front lines. A lot of his coaches from Lorient end up on the front lines. A bear himself fights and is injured, and after seeing the death of many of his students and coaches and working to rehabilitate himself and then eventually being put in charge of other students, uh, I'm sorry, other soldiers that he helps to rehabilitate. He kind of recontextualizes his success hmm. and world war one ends several years later by 1916 a bear is kind of out of the limelight of the war. It's not over at this point, but he has been injured. He's done his kind of due diligence with the military rehabilitating soldiers. And he sort of turns his back on engaging with the French military. He's seen, you know, the war machine chew up too many people at that point. And so he leaves and he starts to work kind of on engaging more with the civilian population. Mm -hmm. So that was something that we we talked about. One of his main motivations was, you know, this movement shouldn't just be for soldiers, it should be for everybody. But he'd taken a step back from that due to all of his work in Lorient and then in Rennes and then his success. Now he's given a chance to take that movement back into the civilian population. And the first thing he does is he formalizes his obstacle course that he used in training and he calls it the Parcours du Combattant. Again, this is for anyone who's familiar with parkour history, the word parkour should sound quite familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also starts to incorporate quadrupedal training into his work, both with civilians and with any military folk. There is an interesting moment where for a long time, militaries in the West refused actually to use quadrupedal movement as part of their training because they thought it was too savage and degrading mm. for their soldiers and when World War One started and a bear saw the conditions they were fighting in, he was one of the few to implement quadrupedal training. And the French government saw that the folks he worked with who were training on crawling skills and crawling efficiently were the ones that survived better in the trenches. Hmm. So quadrupedal training is adopted universally by Western militaries at that time, um, in large part due to a bear's involvement. Wow. And 
this is uh, again 1916 he formalizes his obstacle course he starts to move away from working with the military and in 1919 19, excuse me he finally cuts those ties formally so the war ends 1918 mm-hmm. 1919 he's out of there and the same year he moves to um <clears throat> excuse me a town called Deauville and he begins a project and a facility called La Palestra mm. can I ask real quick before we go into yeah. La Palestra because it's a fascinating chapter uh do you feel like it's like, do you have any indication through what you researched on, you know, obviously it's a horrible experience to have people around you die. Many of the people that he probably loved and, and trained and his students and coaches and whatnot. Is it, is it like an ethical decision that he was coming to? Like, is he sort of, is it just trauma from the war or is it actually that he's like maybe shifted his position on what he values and you know does he want to participate in that machine anymore do you do you have any indication like has he has he shifted a perspective on on that if you know what i'm asking yeah it's hard to say exactly what his motivation was Hmm. i think it's pretty clear that he no longer wanted to engage with the french military complex directly Mm -hmm. i imagine he felt some responsibility for watching so many of his students and athletes and coaches die in the trenches. Um, Something that we can look at historically is that he refuses several posts and offers to work for military schools and departments after the war is over. Mm. So they wanted him. (laughs) It's not like he was cut loose. It's like they wanted him. They were willing to put him in positions that were not traumatic that, you know, it's not like you're training soldiers. It was, these are military schools. Maybe you're training eight to 16 year old boys. Mm-hmm. Um, and he still refused to work with them. So that to me seems to imply he had a problem kind of with the general concept of training people for war at that point. Mm-hmm. And later on, we'll see that he, his disengagement with the French military and generally like later on with the, the French government as a whole he kind of becomes more and more of a libertarian as he gets older. <laughs> He's very individualistic as he gets older mm. um, in terms of how he engages on a public level. So I'm not un- entirely sure, but I think it's fair to say that at least the things that happened to him, he didn't want to, he didn't want to reinforce any of those systems that were in place. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, um, yeah, it's good to know that I'm excited or I um, appreciate knowing yeah. that he turned down some of those roles, whether he was interested in, we don't know why yeah, we don't. he turned it down, but it is fun to, or not fun, but it is interesting to think about just, you know, what was driving him because obviously he had the Mount Pele, you know, influencing his assessment of what is important and where he wants to point his compass or like, what's his true North on yeah. some of this stuff. And then with the war being the, what it was, uh, it's certainly in my world, you know, and just listening to the story, it sort of puts everything again into m- different perspective. And when, you know, you realize, okay, well, there's, there's the natural element and there's always the human element, you know, yeah. us fighting with each other has always been a huge part of absolutely of what people want to do with movement and how they want to weaponize it. And it, it's an interesting. Note. Yeah. And I don't think that he felt guilty about you know his students participating in the war necessarily yeah but i do think that maybe he realized this is the end game of war Mm. the end game is what i'm seeing here and world war one it's hard to overstate yeah that's what particularly yeah it's really hard to overstate in the context historical (laughs) context how traumatic that would have been because large-scale mechanized warfare until then i mean we had never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. Um, And hopefully we don't see anything like it in the future. And I think that the move to La Palestra for Iber was a move back to the natural, Mm -hmm. a move back to his roots and where he kind of saw this ideal relationship that human beings have with movement and with nature Mm -hmm. because he had seen the dark side and he needed some balance. Yeah. And not only does he um, stop working with the French military, but in terms of balance, he 
at La Palestra works exclusively with girls and women. And this is a chapter of Iber's history I'd know nothing about. He opens La Palestra with a woman named Yvonne Moreau. And Moreau had been a former student of Georges Demeny, who was the cinematographer that we talked about. And she had been one of the few female instructors at the college at Rheim. And after several years of working together, Baron Moreau got married. They opened La Palestra and they worked together to build um, a group of female instructors who were comfortable and competent in the Méthode Naturelle instruction. And they build a curriculum for La Palestra. And this quickly becomes one of the more popular, I don't want to say schools because it was, it's almost like a camp in a sense. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, it was a place that wealthy people would send their daughters for an extended period of time to learn about all types of things. And it wasn't just physical education. There was also an emphasis on, um, you know, housework and cleaning and, cooking and life skills that women at that time period needed to know. The cool thing about it is that where in a lot of places, those life skills were kind of used as a bludgeon to keep women in line with society. Mm -hmm. uh, A Baron Moreau managed to create something that demonstrated how those life skills could be useful to an independent woman. Mm -hmm. And one of the cool things about La Palestra, uh, they have all these women who are coming through girls and women who are coming through the program uh, two of the girls end up being the first to sail their own sailboat. Uh, I'm not sure if it was across the Mediterranean or across the Atlantic, but it received a lot of uh, recognition in French press at the time, merely because they were sail- sailing a boat by themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, at a similar time uh, in 1919 as well, a bear and Moreau co-author the female physical education, muscle and plastic beauty. And it is a commentary on both kind of social expectations for women at the time, physical training and physical expectations for women and what the French social, socially constructed perspective on beauty said about the culture at mm-hmm. the time. So it was this really, really important, deeply kind of philosophical work mm. uh, and also deeply feminist at, a, at an early time. And uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that it happened in France where you eventually have people like Simone de Beauvoir who lead that like second wave of, of feminism. So I was not aware of a bear. I, you, you can tell from his method when you learn a little bit about it that he probably was somebody who wanted to provide equal opportunity. But mm. uh, seeing him actually go and create that space and work with his wife to, to put that into action especially after one of his biggest inspirations were those Greek statues of the gods and the goddesses Mm -hmm. and the coal women in Martinique. And it was really impressive to me that he went and put that into action uh, at a time when French society wasn't necessarily conducive, particularly for someone coming from a military background Mm -hmm. Uh, to make that leap was, I think speaks a lot about Hebert and, and obviously the influence of his wife on his character, but also the roots of his method and what that philosophy has to say going forward yeah absolutely I, I love that it ties that in i think it's it's it just keep is very in keeping with the whole theme of it which is to be useful and to be natural you need to be you know as unbiased and engaged and in touch with nature as it can be and it's clearly again it might just be a nice example um and i'm speculating but just having that you know the world war one that traumatic that obviously horrific images and experiences that he'd lived through it's a pretty easy conclusion to draw that he might have been reminded like there's something unnatural about this and maybe i need to go look where there's fewer men killing each other and just you know at least there's there's one piece of this equation that's missing which is women right now that he wants to point to and and probably learn from as much as educate yeah i think that's very fair to say um and his work at la palestra didn't go unnoticed. He became even more popular outside of kind of the French government. And this is around the time, 1925 to like 1935, where his methodology starts to become adopted, not only within France, but all around the world. And it's adopted by the um, French firefighters, the police, the military formally has adopted it at this point. 
um, private companies like Michelin Tire Company, they use a bear's method to help their workers exercise in the yard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they take the break and they go have an, an ebertism session. And uh, it's really cool because we get to see his method had always been something that was intended for a wider audience, for, a, for a, a broader audience as well. And it starts to explode into that. And these centers start popping up in all of these countries. And uh, in 1930, you had over 250 Ebertiste centers. Hmm. And this is also around the time, by the way, I'm saying Ebertiste. There was a, a name change from natural method to Ebertism, and hmm. they'd be called Ebertistes. Um, so that name change, ironically, was also kind of the point at which Ebert starts to disengage from his own <laughs> popularity and fame. You've got these centers popping up. They're free. They're open to everybody. All ages are welcome. Men, women, doesn't matter. And as it's becoming more and more popular and slipping out of kind of Hebert's control, he starts to disengage with it. Mm. The folks who are organizing these centers all over the world want him to be the president of their association. He declines. They're basically, they go to him like, you don't even have to do anything. We just want <laughs> you to be there. Like just you say created this thing. And he continues to decline. In 1942, he's offered position as chairman of the French Federation of Physical Education. He declines. <laughs> so he goes from in 1904, being this guy in Lorient with these crazy ideas, 1942, the French government wants to put him in charge of all of physical education <laughs> nationwide. And he is just a little bit too, you know, he's too disenfranchised. Uh, is that the right word? No. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I don't know. I mean, what do, what is the speculation or what is the evidence that we can see or that you can point to historically the, of why he's decided to disengage? I mean, his, his ideas have finally spread like wildfire. You would think he would be over the moon maybe with it, people adopting his principles and, and maybe seeing it but as you kind of started to allude to he's losing con- a grip on what it is being interpreted yeah. as and and how it's being used and maybe you know it's being diluted to a degree but to get to all the masses and that can always and, and i love this part of the story too because this is so parkour you know as we'll see as the episodes drop out is the you know the the disappearance of our, our greatest <laughs> leaders and, and innovators and influential figures often seems to coincide with, you know, this, uh, growth of explosion. Popularity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, a, thank you for writing my course there. <laughs> so dilution is a good word to describe what happens, particularly when the French military adopts a bear's method. Hmm. The, one of the primary reasons he'd moved away from them is that he saw his method being used more and more as a focus for physical achievement and less and less as a method for developing the human being. Mm-hmm. Military complex does not want people that are just doing their own thing, looking to self actualize. <laughs> they want that. That's not, it's not effective. Right? <clears throat> so they downplayed that aspect of a method. He recognized that. And then because the, that version of Ebertism was the most popular, widely spread one initially, I think a lot of the subsequent versions that were adopted continued to become more and more, here's the sport and mm-hmm. less and less, or more and more, here's the practice and less and less, here's the, the thought and the philosophy and how to integrate mm-hmm. that practice into your life. And Ebert was going in the other direction, mm-hmm. particularly after La Palestra. He was really going heavier into you know, the movement is important, but only as important as your ability to integrate it. Mm. And I think that that is the primary reason why he didn't want to be associated. He didn't see the pop version of his method aligning with where he wanted it to be and where he'd envisioned it. Maybe when he even started thinking of it in 1902. Um, Sadly, he was not around much longer. Mm -hmm. Um, after World War II, the influence of his method starts to dwindle. I think the fact that he disengaged with it was part of that reason. Uh, we also see the French military uh, 
after their pretty disastrous involvement in both Vietnam and in Algeria, move away from a soldier-oriented approach to promoting the military and moved more toward a sport-oriented approach. They adopted in in the 1970s this thing called the Fontainebleau Doctrine, which um, essentially turned their training almost into like a sports training Mm -hmm. approach and not not so much combat-oriented. In the middle of the 1950s, Hebert does get some recognition. He's kind of at the end of his life. He has not been in the public spotlight for several decades. He's continued writing and doing his own thing. But yeah, really, he's moved more toward that kind of internal dialogue with movement that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, He accepts being honored by the French government to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Méthode Naturelle. And this is in 1955. There's demonstrations by, you know, everybody that essentially has adopted it. The fire brigade, yeah. you've got the police, the scouts, the National School for Girls Education. And a bear's named commander of the Legion of Honor in recognition for his service to the country. And that's kind of the last time that he is, is seen in the public eye. Um, two years later, he suffers an attack that leads to general paralysis. Um, we don't know if it was a stroke or a brain hemorrhage. That's not clear, but... He is paralyzed after relearning how to walk and speak and write over the next several months. um, He finally passes away in 1957. And grinded it out at the end. And it was an inspiration to a lot (laughs) of people that, you Mm. know, they looked at it and they said, this he's at this point in his seventies and is able to recover from this. Mm and still has the passion for reintegrating movement into his life at that time after he's lost it. I'm to have the fire to relearn those things says a lot. Yeah. Um, but to just kind of talk about his legacy and close up that chapter after again, the 1960s, 1970s, um, the method, method natural, it's not as prevalent in the French military the centers around the world start to lose steam without kind of a track for moving forward and without big leaders who are these cultural icons. There's not a lot keeping people in natural method, particularly in the watered down versions that some of these places had adopted. And kind of by the 1970s or 80s, it was almost forgotten. Mm. The only real remnant that you had were these parcours du combattant. Uh, the obstacle courses that would be littered around the suburbs that were based on a bear's work, but without any context. And we still see those in a lot of places here in the States and, and in Europe, um, the exercise trails. That mm-hmm. is a direct legacy of a bear's work. Mm. But other than that, the name, the ethos, être fort être utile, the philosophy, where all of that had come from, there were a few people carrying that legacy, but the fire was getting smaller and smaller and it wasn't until really the late 1990s with the explosion of parkour in 1997 into the french public Mm. eye that Mm. we see the sort of final form of uh bear's work take shape and there'll be more (laughs) on that in the episodes to come of course we have some uh storytelling to get there so very exciting. Yeah, man. What an incredible chapter of the story. I mean, he's such an amazing and influential figure. The more I've listened to you talk about him, the more I've just been inspired and awestruck about who this guy was and what an incredible life he led to bring all these concepts. He was so ahead of his time in many ways, you could say. Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting to see you know, who is carrying that kind of energy now in my mind, you know, and how that, that there's, there's people and figures that are doing some of the work that he's doing still today. Um, Absolutely. And I think one thing I really appreciated from the great work that Seb Fukan has been doing recently with mm -hmm. all the podcasts and videos that he's been making, which are, I mean, the, the reason we've made this right is so that people that don't have maybe the, desire to listen to all that can kind of get a consolidated version um at only 50 minutes it's (laughs) so consolidated nice and tight but i do think that uh 
it was amazing to hear from Seb that all of that founding group, they were aware of a bear and his legacy because mm. that was a question I'd always kind of had is yeah. how direct was the influence? And we're going to trace that line in the next episode, but from one of the founding practitioners himself, it's really good to hear. Yes, we, we knew about Method Naturel and we knew about the training and we knew what it was like and we knew être faux, être utile, and it was an influence. Mm. So there was that direct carryover into the the founding of parkour which is really really cool yeah absolutely it's so cool and it's crazy to think how much has changed you know even in the court with since, since a bear dying and you know obviously that was pre-internet era and this this whole era that we're living in now i think it's fascinating to look at sort of some of the other little parallels that i saw was you know uh george what was the guy's name this george demony demony was like this because it's become a theme in our in our discipline pre- modern day very big is you know what we're seeing on the instagram and social media and in youtube and any videos that are popularized online is the ability to again leverage technology to advance the sport and advance our understanding and ability to practice and share ideas in the way that uh, he was doing in a way with just freeze framing photos and getting a better understanding of the human form absolutely even if it was just one picture at a time. Yeah, being able to demonstrate an exercise in in yep. sequential photos, mm-hmm. that was unheard of at the time. So, and that was an amazing thing to see. Oh, these muscles are doing this, and this muscle is doing this. <laughs> we thought this worked mm-hmm. your quad, but it turns out <laughs> we can see the hamstring is engaged in this picture at this mm. moment. So, yeah, he absolutely used technology, and a bear was an early adopter, and I think that's just as important. Um, you know, he bridged the gap between the, the naturists who, you know, they were like the yogis that wanted to hang out naked in the rain and meditate. Mm-hmm. He bridged that gap between the naturists and the sports scientists. Mm-hmm. And he was able to find something in the middle that spoke to the common person that brought a connection to nature. The, the thing that you were doing was tied to the real world. It had real world consequences Mm. very much as he saw with Mount Pele. And I think that was always in the back of his mind was that his discipline needed to be a function of and and an engagement with the real world and not this artificial world that society had created, particularly the high society of France in the early 1900s. Yeah. Or even the the completely, you know, destructive and violent uh, so, like not society, but just culture or whatever political climate yeah. that created World War One. Absolutely. And so I think it's yeah, that's one of my favorite things that we talked about earlier. You know, before we started recording, even was just like how this engagement with what's really happening is so crucial to where he wanted to take his creation of the practice and his principles. And I think it's definitely a part of how we're engaging and how we're defining parkour today is we need sometimes and there's been a sort of a resurgence of like, okay, well, where, do, where does this all mean? Like what is parkour's identity? And sometimes especially salient right now to me to think about, okay, this is, this is partly what's missing. And this is, you know, what Rafe, mm-hmm. again, we just talked about Rafe being on recently. This is some of the work that he's exploring and Seb is coming back out and helping clarify and give us more context for is what does this movement mean to us? And like, how does it actually work in our lives? Because, um, I it's have a good easy to yeah go ahead. I have a good uh, a good way to think about that. When I started parkour, two thousand seven, the you went out and trained, and the way that you engaged with the environment was, let me find a thing, that's hard, mm. for me to do, and some days it could have been I'm gonna QM, you know a thousand feet. I'm gonna go to the track. I'm going to do 400 meters of QM in the sprint. And then I'm going to try and do this like seven foot wall run when I'm exhausted and see if I can do it. Mm-hmm. Other times it maybe it was, I'm going to work on my balance or stick this tech, you know, work my Kong precision distance, whatever. Now I think a popular training motivation or common training motivation is what clip am I going to get at the spot that I go to today? Mm. And that fundamentally is not engaging with reality in the same way that parkour engaged with reality in the early 2000s. And 
I don't necessarily think that it's a bad thing. I think it just, we talked last episode about that spectrum of sport and culture. I think the more you disengage with reality, the more that you push toward the sport, the artificial Mm. side. And I don't mean artificial in a bad way. And it's not a knock against anybody who wants to go you like any training motivation is good, right? Yeah, you you yeah. doing a thing is better than you not doing it. But I think it's important to also try to engage with the other side actively and make sure that you are staying rooted in some type of more maybe primal or more intrinsically motivated engagement with the natural world. Especially if you're struggling. You know, I think that's one of the reasons like uh, to, to this me for this for me, this clarifies some of that, those questions that a lot of us run into in our training when we get too far down that rabbit hole where we're trying to get so focused on a clip or a competition mm-hmm. or the sporting mechanisms or, you know, even just catch up with the catching into the trends that happen within the sport or on the Internet. And this can recontextualize and help you understand, like, oh, yeah, you can forget the identity of parkour and like obviously it's still being formed, but this is one of the ways that it seems to be evolving in a, or this is some of the, this is, I think you've touched on something that is what, what is holding us back. Cause there's some, mm. there's some distant dissonance with, and I think some people can't point their finger at it. And this is sort of what you're pointing to is like, I've, I see the dissonance. I see yeah. it in the modern, you know, people are, people aren't necessarily sure. Why, why are we uncomfortable with the, the internet? and the the sponsors and some of the yeah. the ways that our culture has expressed and it's 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 this is because we can feel that it's getting away from what it is and even if we don't have the words to articulate it sometimes we yeah. might understand like ah oh, we're i'm getting pulled off center by by getting into you know producing this content for the wrong reason yeah i mean the metaverse is a great example of an, <laughs> a purely artificial world <laughs> And I love the internet and I love Instagram and I'm on it regularly because mm-hmm. it's also a tool that you can engage with the real world, not in your training, but with the real world community of people who practice. Mm-hmm. And to me, especially during the last two and a half to three years of the pandemic, not being able to see my friends in Europe and getting to watch them train and some of the people that I'm closest to getting to see them live their lives and engage with movement makes me feel closer to them. And I think that there are plenty of healthy ways that we can leverage technology to grow as a community. Uh, It's a maturity thing as well. And I think that, you know, there are ways out. And I think training at height, for instance, is a way out that a lot of practitioners have looked to because that's a very fundamental way to engage with nature. Mm. It's to put yourself in a life or death situation. But... I think there's also the shadow side of it where you, for instance, when not to put kind of any words into the founders mouths, but when, when the founders were doing a lot of these challenges at height and I think for someone that we both know, like for instance, like Dylan, Mm -hmm. um, early days of all of these challenges that he was doing at height, it was a lot of times it was quiet. It was existential. (laughs) It was this, it was exactly, it was a self, motivated and internally focused practice Mm -hmm. and you know the recent uh manpower evolution Mm -hmm. is a good example of something like that started not as let me prove myself over this gap but let me use this gap to prove to myself something Mm -hmm. and now it's become let me use this gap to prove to the world yeah and not necessarily that's how everybody is doing it but there is a certain element of broadcasting achievement and engaging uh, in that more artificial sense that makes that boundary a little bit more blurry. Mm-hmm. And I think that when we pursue training at height and things like that, it's a really important to recognize is what I'm actually after maybe a more honest engagement with nature mm-hmm. and with reality. And if so, am I getting it through this or is this just hiding the problem and feeding me with something that feels like it's fixing and feels like I'm engaging with nature, but really I'm just like spiking my adrenaline Mm -hmm. and feeling what it's like to be alive in this moment. And then I go back right back to where I was. Yeah. And you know, I, I think like, again, 
I love, I have a ton of respect for like the PK Gen guys, the old school guys, um, watching like Laurent Piemonte see his Instagram. It's just every day. He's like, went out for a run, did a thousand and one squats today. Go mm-hmm. do the, it's, it's never anything crazy. Yeah. It's something that everyone can do well, if they try hard, you see, but you, it's fundamental and it <laughs> engages you with what is there. You see, uh, Tim Sheaf's another example of someone who was at the very top of the sort of where you would, you would imagine a young 12 year old aiming, you know, winning competitions in videos, in magazines, even in like popular culture, and then completely making sort of a a pivot pivot towards nature and, and swimming and just hiking and getting really, really focused on getting in touch with nature. And Rafe's another person who again exists in that space and how has always kind of tried to draw people towards, towards that. Um, but yeah, very fascinating. I think, yeah, I love what you just said. And I think it can be useful to people whenever they're feeling like they have entered into a, a territory or a part of their training where they're not quite sure maybe what what is it that's missing if I feel like something's missing or why have I lost motivation? This yeah. could be one of the answers to that question. Yeah. Find the reality that you need to engage yeah. with more directly. Love it. Love it. I absolutely love this series. And uh, thank you again, Max Henry. We will see you on the next episode of Parker History.